the Radium Girls, Luminescent Paint, Glow-in-the-Dark Watches, and the Women Who Died Making Them, by Samantha Camaray and Emma Vattenstall. In 1898, Marie and Pierre Curie were hard at work in their lab in France. The couple were very interested in radioactivity, and together they discovered radioactive elements in the mineral pitch blend. They named these new elements polonium and radium. For this accomplishment, the Curies were awarded the 1903 Nobel Prize in Physics. Their new discoveries soon traveled across the Atlantic, capturing the public's fascination. America was enchanted with radium. Ads appeared in every newspaper describing the miracles of the element and hawking everything from radium water to radium makeup. It was seen as a magical substance with many health benefits. Radium was also useful to the war effort. The First World War was well underway, and American factories were kept busy producing supplies and equipment for the Allied powers. Radium and zinc sulfide mixed together created glow-in-the-dark paint that could be applied to watch dials, airplane gauges, and other equipment. These were now in demand because they allowed soldiers fighting in World War I to see the time and their equipment without turning on a flashlight or airplane cockpit lights. One of the foremost companies that produced these glow-in-the-dark watches and dials was the Radium Luminous Material Corporation, later renamed the United States Radium Corporation. The company employed young women, many still teenagers, to paint the dials with luminescent radium paint. The women were glad to have this job because they made good money and worked in comfortable conditions. In order to paint the very detailed small numbers and features of the watch, the dial painters engaged in a practice called lip pointing, that prevented the bristles of their brushes from spreading. The workers were told to put the brushes in their mouths and lick them to a point. This process was described by the phrase, lip, dip, paint. But every time they licked the brush, the workers ingested radium, which unknown to them was actually extremely dangerous. The scientists who were developing it knew of some of the dangers and took great care not to expose themselves to radium, but unfortunately they didn't take the same precautions with their workers. Even as radium was widely celebrated, researchers in the 1910s were beginning to understand its dangers. One of the founders of US Radium had once hacked off his left index finger because it was infected with radium. And in 1921 wrote that, one could handle radium only by taking the greatest precautions. Men who worked in the labs extracting radium were given protective equipment, lead-lined aprons, and forceps. But the young women still received no protection because they were supposedly only being exposed to minuscule amounts of radium. The dangers of the radium were never communicated to them. In fact, they were assured that radium was completely safe, even healthy. In the 1920s, the factory workers, nicknamed the Radium Girls, finally discovered they had been ingesting this radium unknowingly due to the negligence and miscommunication of their employer, and they filed a lawsuit. The publicity surrounding the suit would eventually result in occupational disease laws, a greater understanding of the impacts of radioactive substances on the human body, and precautions to prevent radiation poisoning during the development of weaponry. But before any workers had even considered the lawsuit, women were dying. They suffered from anemia and horrible infections in the mouth and bones. One woman's jaw was so infected that her doctor was able to lift her lower jaw away from the surrounding tissue. Between 1922 and 1924, there were three state investigations of the radium plant. A chemist confirmed the danger of the radium, stating, I would suggest that every operator be warned of the dangers of getting this material into the mouth. Yet still, no action was taken. Finally, in 1924, U.S. Radium hired a Harvard team to study the effects of radium on their workers, spurred on by a loss of employees who were scared they would also become ill. Dr. Cecil Drinker, the head of the team, told the company that the illnesses in the young workers were caused by radium exposure. He wrote that radium itself, absorbed in minute quantities through the skin over long periods of time, is deposited in the bones. Since it apparently behaves like calcium, this deposition seems highly probable to us. The head of U.S. Radium dismissed Drinker's findings, writing, Our conclusion is that there is nothing harmful anywhere in the works. When the report was submitted to the New Jersey government for review, it had been altered to state that all employees were in good health. 
five former dial workers finally brought a suit against the company in 1928. Catherine Schwab, Grace Fryer, Albina Larice, Kinta McDonald, and Edna Hussman were each seeking $250,000 in compensation to comfort and maintain them to the last of their days. All were suffering greatly as a result of radium poisoning. Catherine's spine was gradually decaying. Grace had undergone 19 surgeries. Albina Larice was bedridden and had lost her teeth. Kinta McDonald was paralyzed, and Edna Hussman could not use her left arm. The first hearing was held in the spring of 1928. However, the next hearing was delayed until September at U.S. Radium's request. The girls' attorney, Raymond Berry, tried to rush the case through court for fear that his clients would die before it was resolved. Alice Hamilton, a Harvard professor involved with the case, brought it to the attention of her friend, Walter Lippmann. Lippmann was editor of the New York World, one of the most influential newspapers of the time. His passionate coverage, along with other newspapers throughout the country, brought attention to the women's plight and put the pressure on U.S. Radium. After hearing of the delay in the trial, Lippmann wrote an angry editorial and said it was a damnable travesty of justice. There is no possible excuse for such a delay. The women are dying. If ever a case called for prompt adjudication, it is the case of five crippled women who are fighting for a few miserable dollars to ease their last days on earth. In June, under great public pressure, U.S. Radium negotiated a settlement with the women. Each of the women received a $10,000 lump sum, $600 annuity, and payment for medical and legal fees. But receiving this money did not stop the radium that was slowly poisoning them. All five of the women named in the lawsuit died within five years of receiving compensation. However, their fight was not in vain. As the story of the radium girls was heard around the nation, critical provisions were made to mitigate the possibility of this happening in the future. The negligence of U.S. radium demonstrated the need for more legislation to ensure employees were safe in their jobs. When U.S. Radium settled on an agreement with the Radium Girls, it was the first time in U.S. history that an employer had paid its employees because they had contracted a disease in the workplace. This set a new legal precedent and was a major step in workers' rights and the labor movement. Ultimately, the labor rights and industrial health movement succeeded in the creation of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which still exists today. The Radium Girls' story also led to studies on the effects of radiation on the human body. Researchers at the Argonne National Laboratory's Center for Human Biology studied the surviving dial painters. The women agreed to blood tests, x-rays, exams, and bone marrow biopsies so that the medical field could understand more about the dangers of radium. Their research led to the development of more quantitative measurements of radium, including dose, the knowledge of how much radium a person can withstand safely. With help from the radium girls and the widespread knowledge of the case, it became possible to harness positive aspects of radiation safely. The radium girl's story again saved lives when radioactive materials became important in the development of the atomic bomb during World War II. The scientist Glenn Seaborg, who worked on the Manhattan Project creating the atomic bomb, wrote, As I was making the rounds of the laboratory rooms this morning, I was suddenly struck by a disturbing vision of the workers in the radium dial painting industry. Conscious of the girls' fate, Seaborg then insisted that the Manhattan Project research the effects of the radioactive element plutonium and implement protections that saved thousands of workers from radiation poisoning. In 1963, the Limited Test Ban Treaty, fought for by Seaborg, provided that the U.S., USSR, and U.K. were not to test nuclear devices above ground to protect the general public from radioactivity. Without the Radium Girls and the publicity surrounding their case, Seaborg would not have pushed for such safety measures during the development of weaponry. The miscommunication and deliberate concealment of radioactive dangers led to the girls' deaths, but it was also communication that resulted in long-lasting changes and alerted the world to the dangers of radium. Ultimately, The Radium Girls is a story of five women who bravely pushed back against a large corporation to tell the truth that not only was radium a silent killer, but the corporation was too.